Hello. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Good sunflower. Where are they? Are they not real? Are they? Are they real? No, they're not real. I've had them. Wrong, wrong time of year, isn't it? Wrong time of year, but I've had them. They've been in many an art classroom with me. <laughs> they are good. Oh, thank you so much for being oh. so approachable and agreeing to do this. No, I think it's quite important to. Um, well, I'm really uh, keen on uh, uh, art being taken seriously in primary schools. Yeah. Yeah. Part of why I want to do this and speak to artists and people like you is because I think teachers come under a lot of pressure to teach art in a certain way. And I think it's really important that we get the input of real of artists um, to kind of give teachers that bit of backup to say, look, actually, you don't have to teach art like this and art is different. Well, I understand um, from doing, you know, advocacy things themselves, you know, for myself, it's... Uh, it's tricky, isn't it? If you're if you're a primary school teacher, there's no time on the timetable. But also, maybe art is not your, um, you know, you don't feel confident yeah. as an artist. You know, I mean, I think everybody's an artist, but people are. You know, it's not. It you know, it's like if I was going to primary school and taught music, I would feel not very confident to do yeah. that. So, so it's that sort of thing, isn't it? It's getting people yeah. to feel. Actually, we know because we're artists, practitioners, that actually it's easy to show people how to do mm. things but mm. if you're i suppose if you're a bit uncertain about it it's very difficult so it? there are some common threads of um issues that come up when i'm talking to primary school teachers and that's one of the big ones is confidence and so mm. i'll always try and start a training session by tapping into those adults as artists themselves because the primary school teachers like you say they're teaching all the subjects which is just I mean, to be passionate and knowledgeable about all the subjects is such a huge ask. Mm. But like you say, I really believe that inside of us, we all are creative. I know a bit about your parents being artists, but I'd love to hear from you about your experience more around that primary school age, if you can remember, um, of, of, <laughs> of um, art and education and influences. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I went to, uh, you know, an inner city primary school in Wandsworth <laughs> but uh, but yeah and uh, and actually that was the 1960s I think in that era people uh, really believed in um, art in schools art in education because you know because of all of these things it's to do with the kind of ebb and flow of what's going on and what's around and and I think in that period there were lots of you know there was a there, there, there was the you know the beginning of the comprehensive school system was coming in they there was a sense in the country that really everybody should contribute to society in lots of different yeah. ways and that every kid's voice was important so I had a kind of although it was just a state school it wasn't a Steiner school or anything like that there was a lot of art in the school mm -hmm. and uh, and the art was uh, good and it was kind of <laughs> it was kind of experimental and there were lots of people doing things and thinking about children's art then there was a, a wonderful artist called Don Pavey who wrote a book called Children's Art Games mm. and in that and I think I was the total child for that. You know, I think the teachers were experimenting on us, really. So we were making uh, paintings which were based about chance. And we were uh, we were making just seeing what paint did with lots of experimental things, playing with paint, uh, but also making narrative paintings. I remember uh, painting a backdrop for a school play and us all painting, you know, our own mm. uh, parents in this backdrop and so the painting grew out of uh, lots of different ideas about uh, about our own experience yeah so it was actually my childhood uh, art experience particularly in primary school was very happy it was very good it wasn't uh, you know it wasn't uh, it was just a very straight school you know mm -hmm. but it was uh, it was very good and there was art everywhere people thought art was very important but I also uh, benefited because my parents you know my parents are uh, well they're not around anymore but they were artists and uh, and uh, they made their livings with art mm. so there was no sense in our household at least that art 
was a hobby or something that's nice to have, but perhaps you can't do it. You know, we were, my dad was running Chelsea School of Art. You know, he, he, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking about making some paintings about his office actually, because he had a telephone in his office. My dad, he had one of these old fashioned telephones and it had push buttons on it. It was, it was an, it was an ancient telephone, but it had push buttons. So you didn't have to dial. Yeah. And the, and the, the uh, little bits of paper, the, the the apartments that you could push a button were painting, printmaking, sculpture, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, design, textiles. So you could, you know, in my imagination, my dad was pressing one of these buttons saying, I want to see how the painting is going on. <laughs> like, oh, there you go. The painting's coming on very well, thank you. Okay, I'm going to find textiles now. <laughs> so I thought that was that was basically my dad's job. Yeah. I mean, of course, his dad wasn't. His job wasn't really like that. But my imagining of it was that it was like that. And so art was uh, art was very important. Yeah. And uh, and it was a good. And I think that period was. Uh, I think it was uh, probably uh, an exciting time. You know, lots yeah. of developments going on. Lots of there are a lot. And I've got a big collection of them actually. Uh, books on teaching very basic kind of kinds of printmaking and uh, and block printing, lino cutting, all that sort of thing. I think there were lots and lots of books like that around. Yeah, I've got a few of those and they're written in a very, the, the kind of the, the style of writing of that time. I really like it because it's really sort of quite simple and very kind of, you know, like, yeah, just simple, clear, descriptive writing about how to do these art techniques. And I've got a few of those. Those. Well, it's very nice, you know, because it's also that, that they were they they knew that problem that not everybody teaching a child art in a primary school would be a practitioner of art. So I think they were thinking about that, yeah. and also they were thinking about also I think in that era, and I think it has its roots back after the First World War, actually, in the birth of. Uh, children's art education with people like uh, Franz Zizek, you know, who yeah. and they were they were thinking, you know, they were thinking that was uh, that was when uh, you know in the early twentieth century that was when Freud and Jung and Steiner and all these people were thinking about the the life of the mind of the human being. Of course, it starts with a child, yeah. and so those developments in art education, people were thinking about that again yeah. in the sixties because they were thinking. You know, they're going to build a new society of all these young children who are going to, you know, go off and be the adults of the future. And they need to be well-rounded human beings, you know, and that's really part of that story. I think of that a bit in education now. And I think with all the kind of pressure that comes from being inspected and looking at levels and, and um, progress, um, I think we've really lost that sense of art or we've lost confidence in schools around art being there as something that enriches children and has benefits that aren't necessarily quantifiable. And I think lots of teachers have lost confidence around art being that as a subject. A lot of the questions I get asked are quite heartbreaking sometimes because they are around things like, how do, we, um, how do I assess whether a child is at expected level in art? How do I assess whether a child is above, below, or just at expected level in art? And that is just, I mean, I'm sure you feel the same as me, that that is, you know, totally. Well, that's carried on. That's, that really came in in the 1980s with yeah. Kenneth Baker because he wanted to ditch the arts in the curriculum, basically. Yeah. But he was persuaded to keep it if it was, you know, in quotes, rigorous. Yeah. And so all that testing then came in there. But that goes all the way through the educational system. Yeah. I mean, I teach the University of Postgraduate Students and the, there are lots of criteria for the students to meet. It just, it, that it just means a degree of lateral thinking and also thinking about where that, I suppose, where that child or uh, you know, where that young person is in terms of their own sense of themselves. Yeah, that's what's know. important, isn't it? And I think, you know, of course, at secondary school and, and, you know, at higher education level, you have to have those kinds of guidelines in a way. But 
what I try and really promote is that the primary school, if nowhere else, is a space where actually we don't need to be, you know, there are no national levels for art at primary school. So we don't need to have that sense of uh, meeting. I think one thing that's useful to say there is that in my, I knew about art because of my parents, but actually in the school mm. there were lots of examples there were there, there, there were interesting bits of art around but it wasn't uh, it wasn't that these artworks were exemplars that's quite an interesting thing mm -hmm. there was no images there was no sense that you you know had to make a work of art inspired by another more right, yeah. you know, historic artist so and i think that that's a bit of a problem although i think it's quite you know it's quite a fun thing to do but it, it you you then have to think about marking somebody's work as whether it's closer <laughs> to a good example of yeah. something else whereas i think all the work that we made at primary school was judged as being interesting if it was judged in a quantitative way at all yeah. but it was judged on that it was revealing of our own intelligence and our own life experience and and our own you know uh remembering of going to a bonfire party or yeah. going to a or going to the zoo or something what we saw yeah was so not important. necessarily Probably. about your the skills in drawing or the skills in painting well, i think it yeah i think it was i think it was a, a little bit about it was a little bit about that but it wasn't about making it close to some sort of example you know? yeah what do you um, think in terms of like um, selecting art for students to look at? How do you how do you go about it? Because obviously there's the canon of kind of, you know, your Van Goghs and your Picassos who are great, but you know it's it's trying to give the people you teach a broad, really broad kind of exposure, like you're saying, to different cultures, folk art, contemporary art. How do you go about selecting what kind of art you're talking about or looking at? Well. I, I, I sort of, I would sort of st try and not go down that road too far. I think it's important to think about kids' experiences mm. and what do they remember of things. And so I suppose you could have any kind of art that it didn't need to be contemporary art at all, but which was, you know, a you know about or uh, descriptive or narrative or in terms of, uh, an illustration and kids books illustration you know anything that's kind of storytelling i imagine is quite useful because then you can think about a remembered experience of the child so the child can think ah oh, uh yeah i remember last week when we went to see auntie and then this is somebody painting you know uh somebody in chunky jewelry or something do you yeah. know what i mean and and uh, and then to think oh what were they wearing you know what were they i would think more in that line because i'm yeah. slightly i mean i, I i'm slightly I, i'm not saying don't bring in art <laughs> oh, that'd be the wrong thing to say i think it's great to you know have examples of bob yeah. and roberta smith everywhere <laughs> oh, <actually. laughs> definitely put them on your uh, <laughs> i think that more of those everywhere <laughs> but i do think uh, but I sort of, I mean, I remember once my uh, my son came home from school and he had made a Van Gogh self-portrait. <laughs> and it's a great image. It's really lovely painting, actually. And he really spent time looking at it and seeing how it was made. But I said to him, were all the class doing that? And he said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <they're all." laughs> you can imagine them all doing that. Yeah. And you think, that's not really how Van Gogh did it. You know, he was actually painting himself. So to, to emulate Van Gogh in that situation, exactly. you need to have a mirror. Yeah, as artists, we're <laughs> more able to work conceptually. And I think like we started by saying, I think it's a confidence thing. And if you're not someone who feels confident or thinks yeah. of yourself as being arty, then thinking conceptually like that is, is a jump, isn't it? It is, but I think there are ways, there are good ways around that. I think it's great to have, things which uh, can relate not so much in terms of like being like that artwork but like things which are just you know something that the teacher considers really beautiful yeah or something or something that the teacher 
considers really colourful mm. or uh, so that there's that kind of investment by the person in the room mm. or something. One of the really powerful things to me when I was at primary school, when I was at primary school, is that we had a teacher from uh, Trinidad. So she had, uh, you know, all of her staff uh, was all about Trinidad in yeah. this room. And we went, you know, we were all studying there and she was telling us about Trinidad and the history of it and the culture of Trinidad and the food and eating yams and all of this sort of stuff. And it was like, well, because she had a personal investment in it, it was really powerful. It's it really, really stable. Mm. It, it brings things alive. It makes things have a, a sort of higher, more vibrant energy when there's personal investment. Yeah. But I, and I yeah. also think like, you know, I absolutely agree that children should use their own memories, personal experiences in their artwork. Because as artists, that's what we do. So. Also, I think another thing that is a, a good thing to have is, is things in other, in other mediums. So I think music is incredibly important. You know, the, the idea that, OK, we're going to make a painting, you know, we're going to do something about colour, but we're going to listen to, I don't know, a bit of Ravel or something or, or, or Debussy or, or, some, or, or contemporary, something which is which makes you think about colour and, and modality, you know, you gotta, it's got to make sense, you know, it can't just be music is good, we'll just play this. Uh, but if the teacher has some sense of that, I think poetry is really important, because poetry uh, sums up images, and then, the, but the images for, uh, the images that any 10 people might have in reading a single poem are many and various. Yeah. So that sort of, that kind of thing where you can have lots of different interpretations. I think that's quite important. Yeah. Multiplicity of interpretations. Yeah. And, you know, thinking about the purpose of education and so the purpose of art education um, to, yes, create little beings that go on to contribute to the society globally and locally, but also about helping those children to feel valued and valid as human beings and I think when you can yeah you can use the example of you know your aunt you're visiting your auntie and that suddenly becomes something that everyone is interested in and everyone appreciates that's so validating and good for your kind of confidence and all those other kinds of um, you know qualities that we want children to grow up having yeah I think that's I think that's a key thing I think remembering things and and children's own particular experience mm -hmm. is really good. And I think that's very helpful for, uh, you know, getting the cogs going in the, yeah. young, in the young mind. You know, thinking about this, because if you're thinking about some remembered experience, you're also thinking about a narrative. And that's a, that mm -hmm. could be expressed as a poem or a piece of creative writing. It could be a piece of music. It could be... A, it could be a, a, a painting or a drawing. You know, it, it, that remembered experience is so important. Mm -hmm. you know, that's about looking as well. It's about looking yeah. and seeing. Yeah. Um, what do you, so a lot of um, what I advocate is really um, appreciating the quality of a good art education at primary level for um, helping well-being and just that kind of, like I suppose we sort of touched on it and validating personal experience and memories but um, for you personally as an artist and practitioner do you see that there is a connection between being creative obviously you're a musician as well so being creative and your sense of who you are in this world your sense of well-being maybe even mental health that sort of well the great thing I mean talking about this in the lockdown hopefully this mm it's on youtube or something it will have yeah. a life beyond this weird time that we're in yeah. but the, there's going to be i mean I, I i think there's going to be very few artists who are having problems in this time yeah. <laughs> because, because we know what we're doing actually in a weird way we're all if you're if you're the kind of artist which i am which i am quite a solitary being and i work a lot in the studio uh painting away listening to music and the radio um it's not really a collaborative activity so i'm kind of totally okay <laughs> in fact no distractions really good so, I know, 
this sounds really sort of annoying and smug, but I, I just don't get bored. I just can always come up with no. a little something. I get totally engrossed. No, and I think that's true. I mean, I think, I think, and I think the, so you're set up, you know, that, that's the thing, actually, if you're an artist, you've always got a, it's not, it's not unique to artists, actually, this. I think it's also probably shared by all sorts of people. I mean, I think probably, you know, business people or, or scientists have this same sense of having a bit of a mission that you're involved in. You're not, working for anybody else really you're working to try and push on some ideas which you know at some stage and and sometimes the lockdown you know the lockdown is a metaphor for the door of the studio or the next time you have an exhibition or or getting something out there or yeah. or reveal or writing a paper and having your experiments uh read by your colleagues and them saying that's okay you know that's interesting what you're doing so i think that that sense of being able to beaver away on something you know uh, uh and um is good i mean if it goes on forever then you're kind of stuck because you're trying to you, in the end you want to uh, flower like a butterfly yeah. and to show your things to people so right. that is amazing. and of course there are lots of people there's lots of kinds of art like theatre and mm. dance and all that stuff which are more stymied than uh for the practitioner yeah than, uh, than visual art but uh, uh but but certainly in terms of well-being i think it's it it does it does have an effect i'm not completely uh, i'm not completely convinced all the time that it helps mental health it can in increase anguish if i'm honest i mean there, there are moments where you can't get something right or you realize that you need somebody else to help you or you need and then you you're you're you are confronted with your own inadequacies as well yeah. as an artist yeah that, that can be that can be challenging so it's, it's not that it's resilient doesn't it <laughs> that's why as well as as well as like you say artists or and and lots of other people being able to draw on like inner resources and just kind of get on with things on their own it does make you really resilient because when you're yeah sort of struggling through with an idea or a piece of work and it looks a bit poo and you're kind of having to be yourself up a bit that's you know it's building resilience which is really good it's building resilience yes yeah. it, does, it does make you resilient yeah yeah it does definitely. make you resilient. Do you ever, have you ever had a period of time when you weren't making art, you know, or making music where you just kind of, for whatever reason, life got busy or the inspiration dried up or? Uh, I've done other kinds of jobs uh, to earn money, but I've <laughs> always been a visual artist. I mean, I've always, that's been at the core of my being since I was probably you know, three years old. <laughs> That's quite weird, that isn't it? But it's uh, but uh, so uh, no, there's never been a period. Actually, I've always had paintings and things on the go, creative things on the go. It's yeah. always about trying to. Still, is about carving enough time to yeah to devote to making things. But and no, I've never had a period where I've thought of myself as something else other than an artist really i know yeah. that makes me a bit weird <laughs> no it's great but actually similarly um olivia who i did my first chat with she grew up her mum's an art teacher and an artist so she grew up and i think i think that must have a lot to do with it if you grow up with art not being something that's separate to you as a person then it makes sense that you know it would feel like i think when i was a little kid when i was at primary school i was obsessed with uh uh being well when i was a little kid i was obsessed with being a train driver and then i wanted to be a vet yeah, same. <laughs> but, yeah. But, but that manifested itself uh, not in an interest in science or in engineering but in lots of drawings of trains and sheep <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and people looked at me and went you know you're an artist <laughs> We're just interested. Just interested in, in drawing lots of things. 
<laughs> lots of boobs. <laughs> so it's kind of, it was a bit like that. <laughs> yeah. Do you um? So obviously, I I know you most for your slow. Is it is slow? Would you call it slogan based artwork or word art or what? What label do you like for it? I like to think of them as very 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 short poems. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but they are slogans. I don't, I don't get angry with the idea of slogan. I, I suppose the slogan is always a political thing, and then some yeah. of my things are not political things. So I, I slightly, but yeah, they are they are slogans. But I like to think of them as very short poems or yeah. sentences. And then then there's, more in, there's more beauty in them than in slogans. I think I love the one about what your mother said about the pencil. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that was that's behind me actually. That's the uh, yeah, the secret to a good life, uh, which was uh, get a good pencil, a two B or a three B, not an H B because they're for architects. <laughs> <laughs> My son is uh, studying architecture at the moment, so uh, he he really likes a, a a really arid, hard pencil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and are both your children? Have you got a son and a daughter? Is that right? Yeah, my daughter. My daughter is an artist. She, uh, but she's uh, well. She makes her own uh, art with its own thing going. But she designs uh, book jackets for Penguin, oh, so nice. she's a graphic designer. Mm. Yeah, Etta. So Etta, Etta's doing graphic design. Yeah. And she, I mean, what's amazing about her, which is totally fantastic, is that she's the evidence. She's kind of evidence of the creative industries, really, and the power of that. That you know, if you hadn't if she hadn't done art at school and gone to art school, she wouldn't have the job that she has now. And she's earning yeah. a really good wage mm -hmm. designing book jackets. So she actually has an employed job as an artist. You know, mm -hmm. she's not a self-employed person trying to yeah. flog her wares. She's just employed as an artist. Brilliant. And that will probably be true of my son as well, if he yeah. goes through and graduates as an architect. Yeah. So it's interesting that... The design, art and design thing, I'm really keen on that because there are there are jobs there, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so, you know, I think that's a good uh, art provision in school should expose children to the fact that, yes, you could, you know, art and creativity is there for you to express yourself, but also industry is there and it's very, very possible for you to go out and get a job doing something that you love and that is creative and artistic and... Yeah, particularly in, uh, uh, like, uh, my son, uh, uh, he shares a flat with a boy who's doing animation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my son is doing lots of computer-aided animation for his architecture course, but the his friend Sam is making all these drawings for, uh, for his animation course. And, you know, when he graduates, he'll work mm -hmm. in animation. So... There are there are jobs there, uh, and and Britain, you know, we're is part of the, a growing economy. Absolutely, yeah. It's not it's not that there's millions of jobs for you know if you want to be a fine artist, I think that that's always going to be a struggle. You know, yeah. to to be the kind of artist like I am, that is a bit of a battle because you have to you have to persuade people that you're work is of uh, value and it that means showing in exhibitions and mm -hmm. uh, a, a, and that you know that that it there's no getting around that that is a bit of a struggle and, how and do you um, do you ever find yourself as a fine artist kind of making art geared towards what you think will work or be received well versus just doing what is in your heart and what you feel like doing you 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 have to do um you have to do what you think, uh, which the thing that you want to make, really, you have to follow your nose. Because in yeah. the end, uh, people think of artists as, uh, uh, I don't know, they think about artists as uh, people who are, you know, living their own creative lives. And actually, they like uh, difficulty and difference at some point. Yeah. And not... Not always, not everyone, but uh, at a sort of serious level, you have to be able to prepare to take risks. Mm. And to take those risks, it means you have to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, I'm fortunate now 
uh, I can do that. But there were, for a long period, it was very difficult. So I've done lots of other jobs yeah. in my life to sort of support my activity as an artist from, mm -hmm. I don't know, all sorts of things, from care work to van driving to... And I, and I still teach in the university. I like teaching. Yeah. Uh, so that, that kind of cross-fertilisation. -fer I think if you want to be... I mean, not so much with primary children, but I think if you want to be an artist, the, the key to it is having you know lots of uh, like di uh, diversity in your yes. project so yes. i you know i teach a little bit i sell work i was just on the phone to my gallery in switzerland about some works that they want to take but then i i'm also doing public art projects as well so those three sources of income keep yeah. me going and teaching i always find is quite grounding because like you say artists can tend to be quite solitary creatures and you know all in their yeah. own head and, and being around other people and teaching and coming out of that bubble is quite it's quite helpful uh, what i found with it as well as uh, as i've got older is that it is amazing to have the uh, possibility to talk to a load of people in their 20s about what they're interested in whereas if you if i wasn't teaching <laughs> that just wouldn't be possible i just yeah. talk to my children so it's actually very nice to be able to do that and to uh to you know show them how things are done mm -hmm. or what you know what ideas are out there that they could be thinking about yeah responding to i i really love that it's and it's fantastic to listen to uh i like i i think listening is like looking you know as mm -hmm. artists we're all about looking and looking at the world and and seeing it but listening is also looking you know it's like mm, okay i am i see where you're coming from i didn't yeah. understand that before, but i do now so that's very important yeah definitely i think yeah de definitely as you get older i think there's you know the tendency with some people to kind of go oh no this is the way i've always done it and this is the way i like to do things but there's so much to be learned from younger people just in general i'm lucky i've got a sister who's 23 so she's a millennial and she just keeps me kind of plugged into <laughs> to that world a bit and what's cool and what's, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. But teaching, teaching, I mean, I think also a lot of the, uh, you know, the great artists that I really admire, they've all been, uh, they've all been a pedagogical kinds <laughs> of artists, if you like, like uh, Paul Clay yeah. and uh, uh, Louise Bourgeois used yeah. to hold big sessions in her studio where people would come and show her their art and uh, so envious of anyone who got to go to a lesson with Louise Bourgeois I mean she's just so so entertaining yeah. so brilliant yeah yeah and so I think that idea about sharing ideas or thinking about or thinking about things or just looking at somebody else's work learning to look at other work I think is quite an important thing to do mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually, in terms of when I get asked a lot from teachers about, oh, you know, how do you assess art? And I don't know how to grade this. One of the biggest, most useful forms of assessment in art is peer feedback and just discussions and just standing around and looking at each other's work and talking about it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's really, that's really good. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, just that, just that uh, like tutorial seminar. Yeah doesn't need to be like that, that that kind of language just sitting around talking about it is good yeah i like using that language with primary school kids they love it I, you know using oh, sort yeah. of like grown-up art terms i'm i've never been a kind of like baby things down kind of teacher you well, know it's nice that when you have uh, it gives a um you know like a like in a university setting with first year it doesn't happen after first year that much but in a first year situation i still teach first years where we have a three hour session i introduce something and we get all the you know paints out or materials out and then they respond to it and then we then we look at all the work at the end that's yeah. always fantastic mm -hmm. you know that's always fantastic yeah okay <laughs> And is there anything um, that you would say to teachers who, like we started with actually, who don't feel artistic or creative themselves, but are finding themselves having to teach or even in a lot of cases lead on art as a subject in primary schools? Um, is there anything you would say to them that might be empowering or help them to kind of drop the worry about it, you know? I think, I take, I, I think one thing about art is, uh, 
very simple to teach, uh, and which is very like very basic and old fashioned. But there's, uh, you know, uh, there's the the formal things, <laughs> which yeah. is like what it is, all the materials, the color, the shapes, uh, and then there's the uh, and then there's the more narrative and uh, conceptual side of things, which might be you know what it is. And I think once you once you understand that there's the material and then there's the storytelling and narrative aspect of it, it becomes simpler to do because then you can you can look at one side of things like that is is that your auntie or is that your uh, uh, your grandfather uh, or is that you know a happy time that you experienced mm -hmm. and so you can think about those things. But then you can also then think about the formal things like the colour and the shapes and the line. And actually, it's nice. I mean, I do very simple things, even with our 21, 22 year olds, where we just where we just paint sheets of paper colour mm. and then throw them on the floor and, uh, and get them all to arrange them in different uh, formations. And you get these great abstract relationships of colour mm. and then people you know, can do different things with that. And I, uh, and, and the car, and then you sort of begin to learn about color and the color wheel and opposite colors and secondary yeah. colors and all that. But uh, actually it's, it's just very sensual, you know, you're mm. just looking at the color mm. and that's a lovely thing to do. And I think it, I think, that, I think the thing to do is to just, uh, I think if you're a bit, if you don't know a lot about it, there are, you know, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of great examples of art, which mm. you can look at and think about, just tease it apart in those two ways. Yeah. You know, what is it of and what is it made of? If mm -hmm. you think about it in those two ways, you'll get somewhere. Yeah. And then the other thing to say is I'm a patron of it is the NSEAD, you know, the, yeah. the, uh, you should, uh, yeah, have a look at that their websites or or subscribe and become a member of that yeah. and uh, they have lots of lovely projects and examples of things that you could do yeah absolutely thank you i think we've kind of we we we've, we've covered all of the things that i wanted to to talk to you about really quite quickly <laughs> My eyes are just wandering around to your background now because I can have a good look at your page. Yeah, yeah, well, I've got all sorts of things over here. Yeah, I, I, I did stick them behind here slightly on purpose. Yeah, good, so, good. Uh, <laughs> lot, I mean, I have a studio in Ramsgate, uh, but I can't get there at the moment. Oh. So I'm just working. Uh, I've got a little studio, which is more of a shed, really, in my, yeah. uh, in my garden. Yeah. But it's a miserable wet day today. So it's I'm just in the top bit. of my house. Uh, yeah, and I've got yeah, I've got teaching is beautiful over there. Oh, that's a nice one too. And then one says, uh, "Draw hope there. Art is your human right." Mm -hmm. uh, how do you want the world to change after this? Wow, Art makes you powerful and uh, uh, make a pink on pink painting. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and then over here we've got uh, we've got to tap into the uh, life force, not the virus force. Write poetry, mm -hmm. music, dances, make art. Absolutely. And then at the top, this is a bit of a funny one, but it's a nice. I think it's a nice one. It says, "Devise a symmetrical set stencil based on the shape of your friend's noses." <laughs> and then, <laughs> so it's a kind of slightly mad. But if you do that, actually, you get amazing triangular shape. Yeah. And, uh, you have fun, uh, yeah. <laughs> and noses notoriously difficult to draw. I don't know if you've ever tried to teach pro uh, 30 primary school children how to draw a nose, but you get some interesting um, oh, outcomes. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, just need to follow, <coughs> follow this stick term here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like, a, I like a nose. I think it's a good uh, metaphor. <laughs> it's a funny <laughs> So yeah, what are you working on at the minute? Have you got a particular sort of project or exhibition or anything that you're working towards? Yes, I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm actually, I'm working on, the, uh, uh, let me see this, I don't know, it might not do very well with the reflection of the light, but I can, oh yeah, anyway. wow, that's different. Yeah, yeah, it hasn't got any text in it. Yeah. Love yeah it's a 
<laughs> it's a bit of a mad painting. But basically, it's the pink moon from the other day. Mm. And there was this kind of pink moon. And uh, I'm doing a project where I'm talking to people uh, who live on the Thamesmead estate in, uh, in, uh, out there in, uh, it's near Abbey Wood. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm interviewing them about their lives on the estate. But I can't get there mm. now. Uh, so we're going to put, we're going to do some of these interviews like we're doing now on Zoom. But in the interim, while that's getting sorted out, I thought I'd make some paintings. I took a sketchbook down there the last time I went yeah. and I drew lots of the different places uh, on this side. It's an amazing kind of 1960s uh, concrete housing estate, but it's quite futuristic looking. Right, yeah. And then I thought I'd paint the... Uh, I thought I'd paint the pink moon over Thamesmead. I thought that'd be a poetic yeah, image. Lovely. Yeah, I think, you know, oh, this lockdown situation is, 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 it's really conducive to coming up with new ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been doing lots of, uh, lots of music and, uh, uh, trying to get, I mean, it's very simple and rudimentary, but garage band on these computers is just an amazing yeah. tool. I realised it was even there. <laughs> so I've been using that. Oh, that's good. And so you used to teach at Earlsfield Secondary School, did you? Um, I trained as a secondary school teacher and then I taught primary and secondary art for about 20 years and taught oh. at Earlsfield three days a week for a couple of years which was lovely and I love, like you say, I love teaching and I, the only reason I stopped teaching is because the need for kind of consultancy in primary schools was, was taking over. And now I focus on, on things like this and going into schools and supporting primary school teachers with teaching art. It's gone in different ways over the years, isn't it? Because they've had, I've got a friend who's an amazing guy who goes in and does uh, like kind of en art engineering projects with kids in schools mm. and makes these kind of automatons and things. Oh wow! And, uh, he's had uh, he's had up until all this he had quite a good time. Yeah. It's, he's, he's really been you know he he was telling me that there's there's been a bit of a shift. Yeah. But I suppose that thing about getting it's okay getting somebody in, isn't it? Mm. But you need really to have the the teachers to yeah the confidence that they can do it as well yeah. then you've then you're then you've got two prongs in your yeah you've got, you know, and i think you know i would say this and i would think this but i think there's a benefit to just generally increasing injecting that kind of creative spirit and that kind of um yeah more experimental approach to schools anyway i think schools need some small even if it's just the art lessons some area where that happens within the kind of very rulesy environment of a primary school um so i think it needs to come from within and and having artists in but yeah i think to say also about children and art is that they uh you know like I mean, it's an age old, maybe it's a bit of a cliche, but they do see the world in a very mm -hmm. unique and interesting way, which adults don't. And in two ways, actually, my kids really inspired me <laughs> when, I, when they were little. One was my son was making a drawing and uh, I, I'm going to do it for you now. It's like, a, yeah, it's like this. I'll show you this, this cut. The, the logic of the drawing was brilliant. Hold on. Yeah, so his drawing was this. So he was doing this. You can see this, but yeah. he was doing. So he was drawing a loop and then running the line through the loop. Mm. And he was about four. It's like a classic uh, Paul Clay taking the line for a walk sort of stuff. And I said, wow, what are you doing, Fergal? And he said, oh, it's a loop drawing, Dad. I draw a loop and then I run the line through the loop. Mm. And I went, wow, that's amazing. That's like an algorithm, a pattern, <laughs> yeah. a recipe. You know, <laughs> I can I... see how that would be really like mesmerizing. Is that repetitive yeah. action? <laughs> and that, that, I found that really amazing. And then my daughter has always been brilliant with words. And I made a painting which I sold to uh, Southampton Art Gallery. Yeah. But she was learning the months of the year. And she was just going winter, then autumn, 
then winter again, then autumn, then winter again. <laughs> and I said to her, what, what's, where's spring and summer, darling? And she was going, no, no, it's winter, then autumn, then winter again. And I made this painting, which was winter, then autumn, then winter again. Oh. And, uh, which is a slightly pessimistic view of the seasons. But uh, some, some, in, some, in Britain, sometimes it can be a bit like that. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I sold it to South L uh, Southampton Art Gallery, and my daughter is still going. Well, I, I want half the money for that. Yeah, That's I'm not my... surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised yeah. at all. <laughs> just, uh, you know, just that. You know, we see it's playfulness. Whether it is yeah. or not, I don't know. But it's, it's a real beauty. It's language. pure. Yeah, pure beauty. Yeah, it's very right. pure and from the heart, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that's great because as an artist you do want to try and get back to that space somehow mm. because it's and I think this you know this lockdown time is kind of I feel like it's giving some of that back I definitely feel more creative because I've got more time and space um mm. and I I'm a meditator so I meditate twice a day at my best and at my worst it gets dropped completely so of course at the minute yeah. I'm meditating a lot more and I'm feeling just this yeah real kind of slowing down and noticing details and spaciousness around things which isn't there in normal kind of rushing life um yeah thank you so much for being oh. so approachable thank you so much thank take you. care good luck well bye. Done. take care emily nice to meet you you too bye, bye.